And you're welcome to ask additional questions and make additional comments um, in that period. Uh, the big difference being that, that it will be um, no longer recorded. And we ask that that discussion continue under Chatham House rule, meaning that there should be no attribution to either the questioner or the respondents during that part of the session. Um, we find that sometimes uh, people in, in various government roles and other things that aren't empowered to speak officially um, can, can speak more freely uh, under in that part of the session sometimes. So with that, Lionel, Tanya, thank you so much for sharing this important work with all of us. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, Tanya, would you make sure the recording is on? And um, I believe Lionel, you're going first, right? So welcome, Lionel. Yeah, um, thank you, Sean. Um, I take it I'm not muted. Um, are not muted. Yeah. Um, so um, we're going to give a presentation in uh, two parts. Uh, I'm going to go first and then Tanya is going to go second. And I'll say something about uh, the structure of the presentation uh, in a moment. Um, our main claim in this book is, as Sean explained, that rather than people having to argue about whether a global mandatory norm of fair use uh, would be a good idea or not. Uh, we have in fact already got something that approximates to a global mandatory fair use already in the international acquis. And that's in the form of Article 10.1 of the Berlin Convention. And so it's worth starting by just going through Article 10.1, which is entitled Certain Free Uses of Works and says that it shall be permissible to make quotations from a work which has already been lawfully made available to the public, provided that their making is compatible with fair practice and their extent does not exceed that justified by the purpose, including quotations from newspaper articles and periodicals in the form of press summaries. And Article 10.3 goes on to add two conditions to that uh, mandatory exception. First, that where use is made of works, it, uh, that mention be made of the source of the work. And secondly, that the name of the author also be mentioned if it appeared on the work that's being quoted. So we contend that this is global mandatory fair use. Why? Because we say it's global. We say it's mandatory. We say that it extends to a whole host of different kinds of uses. And finally, because the key requirements uh, that condition the availability of the defense amount to requirements of fairness, that the work be ha have be been lawfully made available to the public, be, that there be attribution, that the use be proportional to the purpose and the use be in accordance with fair practice. And the plan is that I will talk to one, two, and three, the global mandatory and use components, and that Tan Tanya will then take over and talk about fairness, and then go on to explain the consequences of this understanding of Article 10.1 uh, for aspects of the international uh, uh, copyright law, aspects of national copyright law in various jurisdictions, and certain kinds of practice. So firstly, I'm designated to do the easy bit. Why is this global? Well, it's global because it's a provision of the Bern Convention and at present Bern has 179 members, but also because uh, under the TRIPS agreement, um, Article 9 of TRIPS requires uh, contracting parties to um, implement Articles 1 to 21 of the Berne Convention, excluding Article 6 bis. And so there's an obligation under TRIPS as well as under Berne uh, to implement Article 10.1. And the WTO has 164 members. So those two treaties pretty much encompass most significant countries uh, of the world. Um, so, sorry. Uh, not being very competent today. Uh, there you are, 179 members of the 164 members of, of TRIPS. Secondly, 
why is this provision mandatory? Well, uh, we think that on the plain meaning of Article 10, it is self-evidently mandatory. Uh, Article 10.1 begins, it shall be permissible. And this can be contrasted with the other provisions dealing with exceptions in the Berne Convention, Article 10.2, Article 10 this, Article 9.2, which say it shall be a matter for legislation in the countries of the union to permit. So those latter three clearly um, indicate a discretion on member states uh, as to whether and the extent to which they have uh, exceptions that are specified in those provisions, whereas Article 10.1 is mandatory in form, it shall be permissible. And we think that actually you could pretty much stop there and say that's why it's mandatory. But uh, in the book we go on to show that in fact this is the predominant view amongst commentators, both commentators from common law jurisdictions such as Sam Ricketson and Jane Ginsburg, but also uh, commentators from uh, civil, civil law backgrounds, such as Berndt, Hugenholz will be talking after, uh, Henning Grosvies Khan, Annette Raquel Zalabada, etc. So there's a, a widespread view amongst commentators uh, that uh, the, uh, the uh, provision is in fact mandatory. However, there are one or two commentators who disagree with that, um, and we discuss uh, their reasons for disagreeing with the idea that this is a mandatory provision um, in the book, and we explain our reasons for thinking that their views are wrong. So probably the two predominant reasons for saying it can't be mandatory are firstly that it doesn't fit well it being mandatory doesn't fit well with um, the idea that uh, the Berne Convention itself is a minimum standards system because this is a maximal provision and it seems odd to have a maximal provision within a minimum standards uh, uh, treaty. And the second reason is because of the way in which Berne works, that it applies only to works uh, that have their country of origin in a country other than the um, country of uh, the law of the country of interest. So France has to protect under the Berne Convention works which have a country of origin outside France rather than works that have a country of origin within France. And uh, the effect of that is that if this is mandatory, France has to give a quotation right in regard to works with a country of origin in the United States but doesn't have to give a quotation right uh, with regard to domestic works. And the commentators who say it's not mandatory take these two ideas and say, uh, this, it, this means that this couldn't possibly be mandatory. And we give a, a bunch of arguments uh, to reinforce uh, the view that it is mandatory and it was intended to be mandatory. Amongst those arguments, we go back to the travaux of Article 10, which really has its immediate origins in the 1967 Stockholm revision of the Berne Convention. And we go through the immediate history of the Stockholm revision. And we can see from various, at various points in that history, that the question of whether this should be mandatory uh, was in fact discussed. In fact, during a, a meeting in 19, 65, the UK government, perhaps surprisingly, proposed that the quotation right uh, should not be mandatory but should be optional. And that proposal was uh, rejected uh, by 19 votes uh, to seven. And so we think that it is really pretty much incontrovertible uh, that this is a, a mandatory provision uh, within Bern. And as we'll see when Tanya uh, speaks later on, um, some significant things flow from this mandatory uh, dimension. Sorry, I'm failing to, uh, to um, deal with these slides appropriately. So apologies for that. This just says, tells you all the things I've just been saying. Okay, so then we come to the real meat of the provision, um, which is, um, what does it cover? Uh, because um, really it's going to, it's key to our argument 
that the scope of application of Article 10.1 is broader than has been appreciated by some people uh, hitherto. So the first thing to note is that on its face, it applies to all burn works, not just literary works. Uh, the language of the provision says, uh, it shall be permissible to quote from a work. It doesn't differentiate uh, or doesn't specify any particular kind of work like literary work or dramatic work. So it follows, seems to follow from that, uh, that the right to quote should apply to all works. Um, and this view is uh, reinforced by the travaux, uh, where at various points people objected to the quotation rights applying to all works, or they assumed it applied to all works. We can see that at the final uh, intergovernmental conference, uh, where many of the delegates talk about its application to artistic works. And so I think it is pretty clear that it applies to all burn works. It is worth noting, however, that burn works are not all the works that are protected by exclusive rights in the cultural sphere. There are also related rights covered under uh, the Rome Convention. And there, there is no mandatory quotation right. The quotation right is optional uh, for member states in relation to related rights. So one limitation on the global mandatory fair use argument that's important to appreciate is that it applies to burn works, <coughs> but uh, doesn't apply uh, to related rights as such. Secondly, um, the provision in Article 10 applies to all economic rights. It says it shall be permissible to quote, and uh, we think, and it is not limited uh, to the type of right. So we argue, and uh, we use various different, offer various rationales for saying it applies to the reproduction right, the translation right, the communication to the public right, the rights both in um, both in the Berne Convention and also in the WCT and TRIPS. But importantly, it doesn't apply to moral rights. Now this wouldn't be apparent on the face of Article 10 because it says, as I've indicated, it shall be permissible to quote. Um, and uh, one might think then that this was an important exception to moral rights, but the Trevo clearly suggests that it doesn't apply to moral rights. Um, and there is uh, a, a comment in the report of uh, at the intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental conference uh, that the moral rights provisions in Article 6 is reserved. Uh, so we think that that is, uh, is clear. So then we come to the meaning of quotation. And this is really where things get very interesting and, and where the notion of uh, this amounting to fair use um, becomes uh, uh, exciting, really. Um, so firstly, it's worth noting that there's nothing in the language of Article 10 to limit the kinds of purpose for which a quotation can be used. Article 10 simply says it shall be permissible to make quotations from works. It doesn't say for purposes of criticism, review, reporting current events, whatever it might be. It says it shall be permissible to quote. There is, on the language, no limitation at all by purpose. And the travaux indicate that this was intended. Uh, at various points in the, uh, in the negotiations that led to Article 10.1, it was suggested that there should be limitations as to purpose. And at, when those proposals were made, they were then subsequently rejected. And so it is clear that the uh, delegates, uh, the parties to the treaty did not intend Article 10.1 to be limited by any particular set of purposes. So quotation is left open, unlimited by purpose. Uh, so what does quotation mean? Well, we've already noticed that the quotation right applies to all works and is not limited as to how the quote is used. So the concept of quotation 
importantly, needs to be understood not in terms of the print paradigm, but in terms of the way in which that word quotation is understood and used across the whole spectrum of the Berne Convention. And the Berne Convention covers not just literary works that are printed, but it also covers musical works, artistic works, cinematographic works. So, so to understand what the meaning of quotation might be, one needs to go and look and see how quotation is understood, not just in the context of print, though that's an important aspect, but also in the context of art, of film, of architecture, of music, and so forth. And we do that. And we argue that the ordinary use and ordinary meaning of the term quotation outside of print covers frequently use of the whole work, transformative use, and uses without explicit critical commentary. So we argue that the broad meaning of quotation means that a quotation does not have to be short. It can, in some circumstances, be of the whole work. It can be of any type of work. It need not be distinct from the work. It need not be used in another work. And it need not support or further any argument or critique. Quotation is a broad concept, and none of these are necessary conditions for there to be a quotation. Now, I'm going to give a bunch of examples just taken from the book that illustrate how we get to this broad notion. Uh, because we looked, uh, as you would do, uh, first of all, at the pre principles of the treaty interpretation and took them on board. We looked at the structure of the treaty. We looked at the use of the term quotation in various dictionaries in different languages. But we also looked at how the term was used in <laughs> philosophy, in linguistics, in cultural theory um, and in cultural commentary. And these examples that I'm going to give you very quickly are examples of where quotation is used in, in cultural commentaries, or the first three are. And they go to demonstrate, I think, uh, that you can use the whole work. You don't have to use quote in a way that the quotation is distinct uh, from the work in which it's used, and that there's no requirement, necessary requirement of critique or uh, commentary on the work that's been quoted. So the first example here is Cezanne's Fruit Bowl, Glass and Apples, painted in 1878-1879. And this is a very well-known picture. It's in, uh, I think it's in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and um, the example uh, which is described in the literature as quotation, or an example which is described in the literature as quotation, is uh, the reproduction of this image in Maurice Denis' homage to Cezanne in 1900. So here you have a group of painters uh, standing around an easel on which you can see a painting uh, that represents Cezanne's compotier. This is the uh, Nabi group, and um, they're admiring, clearly admiring uh, Cezanne's work. And that's clear from the title. They're paying homage to Cezanne. And this is exactly the sort of thing we think, or we say cultural commentators in uh, art, the art field describe as quotation. And yet it involves use of the whole work. If you, at least if you, if you ignore say Rosier's hand, there's nearly the whole painting there. Uh, it is uh, reproduced in a way uh, that is not uh, completely distinct uh, from the rest of the image, though one might say it's distinguished and set out uh, by the frame that helps to make it uh, appear quote, like uh, a quotation in print that is, is set in. Um, and um, one might question whether there is any critique or dialogue here between the uh, painting that's using the image and the image itself. Uh, it's called Homage to Cezanne. The dialogue seems to be something along the lines of, isn't this a great painting and aren't all those people admiring it? So the next example 
uh, can, comes from architecture. And here on the uh, left-hand side, you can see a work by a Russian constructivist architect, Konstantin Mel Melnikov. And this is a building uh, called the Rusikov building in Moscow, uh, built sometime uh, in the 1930s, I think. And on the right, there is a building um, by the great British architect, uh, James Sterling, and that's the Leicester uh, University Engineering Building. And the architecture literature does not hesitate to describe Sterling's practice as having been one of quotation of Melnikov's uh, building. You'll see the common tra trapezoidal form uh, that is the lecture theater in the uh, Leicester building uh, that comes from and is similar to the uh, trapezoidal form in the Melnikov uh, image. This is clearly described and regarded in the architectural field as a key example of quotation in architecture. And indeed, Sterling is regarded as really the master of quotation in architecture. There's a, a museum in Stuttgart, which the German paper Zeit described as the, and you'll have to forgive my German, the Zitaten Museum, the Citation Museum, the Quotation Museum, because of the way that Sterling pulled together lots of different uh, ideas and expressions from pre-existing buildings into his design uh, of the Stuttgart Art Museum. Uh, and here you see again you have something being described as quotation where a part of the building is taken uh, but it is not distinct, it's not identified as being a quotation by Sterling, it's just part of Sterling's recomposition but nevertheless it is described as quotation. The third example uh, comes from art and film. And on the left-hand side is the uh, very famous image of the nurse or headmistress, depending on which commentaries you read, who is brutally savaged by Cossacks at the bottom of the uh, uh, steps in Odessa in Sergei Eisenstein's famous film, Battleship Potemkin from 1925. And this image was used and it was found in fact in, in Francis Bacon's studio and was used by Bacon uh, to inform a whole bunch of different images that he created, including this one, Study for the Nurse uh, from the Battleship Potemkin. And once again, art critics, art commentators on Bacon describe this kind of use as quotation of the work uh, from the battleship Potemkin. Now, the importance of all these different uses of the term quotation in the cultural theory is they help us to understand the parameters of the not not notion of quotation in Article 10.1 because when Article 10.1 is uh, understood as applicable to all these kinds of works, then we need to know what the ordinary meaning of quotation in the context of those works might be. And here again, you see there is use of the work, but it is indistinct in Bacon's work. There's not a portion marked off by quotation marks. It's incorporated in, in his work and transformed in his work, just as in the Sterling uh, example as well, and also perhaps even in the, the Denis example of use of Cezanne. So from these uses of quotation, we suggest in fact, that the term quotation is broad, very broad uh, indeed, and not limited by any of the typical characteristics of quotation one would think of when one thought of print or text uh, quotation. The final example I want to give before I hand over to Tanya, I hope I'm not going on too long, is, um, a, is a textual example. And this is just to illustrate how the term quotation is commonly used without any critical commentary or dialogue attached to it. And this matters because, as Tanya will go on to say later on, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union in the Pelham case and in the Spiegel case has imported, a, has introduced a very narrow notion of quotation into EU law, 
which requires some intent on the quota to enter into dialogue with the work being quoted. And yet we think that this does not flow from the ordinary meaning of quotation. So it's worth just focusing on these couple of examples. The first is the Langdell Room at Harvard Law School, uh, which has a series of inscriptions by various people uh, to uh, uh, edify the uh, visitors to that room. And the guide they have to those uh, inscriptions says a uh, is entitled Quotations in the Langdell Reading Room. It's obvious that the term quotation includes the use of material that is not being represented just to be subject to criticism or commentary, but has other communicative functions when it is being reused. Equally, the Library of Congress has lots of such inscriptions on its walls. And again, these are described in a pamphlet on these walls inscriptions and quotations in the buildings of the Library of Congress. The term quotation is used ordinarily and standardly to describe many reuses of texts that do not involve critical commentary or entering into dialogue with the text that is being reproduced. And with that, I will hand over to Tanya to take over fairness. Thanks, Lionel. Will you just stop? Yep, great. And I'll share my screen. Okay, and if I could just add to Lionel's thanks to Sean and Peter for inviting us to speak to this network. It, it, it is a pleasure um, uh, to, to speak here and also to see so many um, colleagues attending. Thank you. So I'm dealing with the element of the argument that is about fairness. And in fact, I need to skip back on the slides. And what we argue in the book is that this concept of quotation is moderated or at least needs to see, be seen in the context of the requirement of um, fairness and that fairness actually is given effect to by the provision in several ways. The first is the fact that there's a requirement that the work must have been lawfully made available to the public. Secondly, that there is an attribution requirement uh, as a condition of relying on the exception, that there is also a proportionality requirement. And finally, where fairness um, uh, can come into its own, particularly is through the requirement of fair practice. So we group together these conditions and requirements as mechanisms for uh, uh, pointing to the fairness of a quotation. So if I start with lawfully made available to the public, the wording talks about already, the work has already been lawfully made available to the public. So this precludes any attempt to justify the disclosure of the work by invoking the quotation exception itself. But if the work has been made available, but is subsequently withdrawn, we think that um, this requirement would still be satisfied. It's also important to note that this language was chosen um, deliberately and in contrast to the language of consent of the author with the consent of the author. So that therefore we're talking about mechanisms of lawfully made available that are separate, sorry, that um, uh, are not linked solely to the consent of the author. So that actually this can include where works are made available under compulsory license or through another statutory provision. And in fact, this broader view of lawfully made available to the public is to some extent supported um, by Spiegel online in the Court of Justice, although there are problematic elements to the way in which it's treated in the Spiegel case. Particularly because in that case, the Court of Justice seemed to assume that if a work was made available with a disclaimer, it could only be quoted if the disclaimer was also uh, part of the quotation. And we think that this is problematic. Now, um, another thing to consider is where does the work lawfully 
have to have been made available to the public. And there are some quite sticky pr private international law issues that um, arise in this context. And um, what we suggest is the better view, um, although I'd be happy to hear people's thoughts on this, is that um, we would judge this according to the place where the work was first um, made available. Okay, a second condition of relying on the exception is contained in Article 10.3, as Lionel has already mentioned. And that requires that mention shall be made of the source and of the name of the author if it appears thereon. And as we've previously said, we see this as a condition of relying on the exception as opposed to an affirmative right of attribution. And so it's not synonymous with the right of attribution in Article 6 bis. So what does this mean? Because it is distinct from Article 6 bis. It means that actually we can view this condition um, more flexibly that we can think of attributions in abbreviated form, uh, indirectly um, uh, accompanying the quotation, or indeed even implicit attribution, which one might see in parodies, for example, or where uh, the author or the source is easily identifiable um, through a straightforward search. The next requirement is that of proportionality. And this relates to the statement in Article 10.1 that the extent of the quotation does not exceed that justified by the purpose. And we think that this is a prior distinct inquiry from fair practice that in effect, fair practice is where a lot of the heavy lifting is done in terms of balancing of interests, whereas the proportionality requirement um, uh, as contained within Article 10.1, in fact, has a narrower purpose. So we don't think that this, at this stage, um, that um, the sort of normative value of the quotation should be weighed, that instead, um, what we're looking at is really a question of the size of the quotation relevant to its purpose. And um, it's important to remember that this particular requirement of the exception was introduced in order to counterbalance the removal of short in front of quotations. So as a way of um, uh, ensuring that the fact that the quotation could be um, uh, of the whole work um, uh, could be balanced. So therefore, um, this, this was the main purpose um, uh, as evidence from the Trivo, as opposed to looking at how uh, one would weigh up the different interests involved in thinking about um, quotation and um, the uh, rights of the author. So how then to assess this? Well, we think that it is useful to borrow from Strasbourg or um, human rights jurisprudence not in terms of the wider proportionality test that we see, but uh, in terms of narrower elements. So we see in Strasbourg jurisprudence tests of suitability and necessity, i.e. we could ask, is the quotation capable of achieving the purpose um, that it is supposed to be serving? And also um, whether a shorter quotation would have achieved that purpose and been less restrictive of the author's rights. So what's important here is that we're not looking at uh, strict necessity. Um, we're looking at whether um, it can be, uh, whether, wh whether there's another means which is as effective, but less restrictive of author's rights. And as I said, this particular part of the exception has to be viewed um, in light of this idea of counterbalancing the removal of short before quotation. vision that we think really um, gives a lot of scope for considering whether the use or the quotation is fair is that of fair practice. And uh, when one looks to the Travaux, 
uh, one sees that there's not a lot of discussion about this. However, what is there does point to um, the view that fair practice was going to be a mechanism for balancing the expansion of quotation to include all works and, 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 this diff and different sorts of works. So it was clearly seen as an important mechanism um, uh, of constraining the um, exception. However, as to what fair practice actually means, there was not that much that was said in the Travaux. There's some reference to common law concepts, but um, it's, it's really only in passing. So what we've tried to do is develop um, a notion of fair practice. And to reach that point, we had to consider ways in which fair practice um, could be viewed. And one way is to say, actually, um, Byrne is entirely silent on this. And so fair practice is to be solely determined by national law, i.e. Byrne Union members have complete autonomy as to how they determine fair practice. We reject this approach because we think that the problem with leaving it to national law is that there will be a huge potential for variation and a lack of overarching consistency. And we also think that it would be um, strange that Article 10.1 um, had no concept of what fair practice meant in this instance, given that this is a mandatory exception. And given that when we look at other provisions like Article 9.2, this does and has been interpreted to have um, a normative component or a, uh, a meaning to it. So another approach is to say, well, let's look at state practice. Let's see the extent to which fair practice has been uh, interpreted or implemented by national laws. And this will give us the understanding, a kind of bottom up approach. When one looks at state practice, however, um, there isn't a lot of convergence. The convergence tends to be around um, how much of the work is copied. So in terms of things that might inform practice, fair practice, we see um, the extent of the work that is copied and also the effect of the use on the market. So how much is copied and what's the impact on the market? So this could be one way of, of um, populating the meaning of fair practice. However, it only really makes modest progress in our view. And actually, the extent of the work copied overlaps with the proportionality requirement. So again, we would argue that there's still um, uh, not enough overarching kind of guidance and that because of the mandatory nature of Article 10.1, we would expect there to be um, uh, more of uh, uh, a meaning to fair practice. So another thought, and this is raised um, by Professors Ricketson and Ginsberg in their um, wonderful treatise on the Berne Convention, is to really see uh, fair practice as synonymous with the three-step test in Article 9.2. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. What I wanted to say here is that we don't make that assumption that it's synonymous. We think that potentially there are differences um, between fair practice and the three-step test. So we wouldn't want to conflate the two. So the position that we reach is to argue that actually there is a meaning to fair practice within Article 10.1, that the normative content is not left entirely to uh, Burn Union members, but there is a um, meaning within Article 10.1, which can be informed by the object and purpose of the Burn Convention and by this provision in particular. So what we argue is that, in fact, it can be informed by uh, a number of key concepts. So it can be informed by the reasons why protection is given to authors, which can be based on notions of both economic and moral harm, that the it, it, that if we look at um, economic and uh, moral justifications for protection, this can lead us to consider things like the nature of the quotation, its size, 
and the extent to which it harms the market for the work. It can also extend to the extent to which it harms the integrity interests of the author as well. The rationale behind the quotation exception is very much grounded in freedom of expression. And so we argue that actually freedom of expression norms can help um, uh, give meaning to fair practice. And here a key consideration would be the expressive purpose of the quotation. What is its expressive purpose? Here it could relate to um, whether it's political expression versus commercial expression. Um, this might be something um, that is relevant to, to weighing um, whether this is a fair quotation or not. We might also look at the nature of the claimant's work if we're thinking about freedom of expression norms. We also draw on distributive justice literature um, and there's much less on this than there is on uh, economic harm and, and moral harm. Um, but there's some very um, good work uh, discussing this and in terms of how distributive justice principles might inform the way in which um, we uh, um, view exceptions. And here um, it's arguable that we can think of fairness in terms of the, distri this, the distributional impacts on different types of users. So perhaps we want to think about quotation in the context of certain educational uses or certain translations into neglected languages or for poorly financed creators to, to pick up on an idea from Van Howling's article from 2005. And then we argue that um, in relation to custom and fair practice that um, we have to be careful um, or that we should be careful in, in just adopting custom and here draw on some of the criticisms um, from uh, um, the work of Jennifer Rothman and also Kenneth Cruz, so that there may be some scope for considering custom, but we certainly wouldn't want this to be determinative. But we also think that um, bad faith, notions of bad faith would not fall within uh, our meaning of fair practice. Why? Because bad faith actually is a bit of a vague term. It can mean the manner of obtaining the work, and this is better dealt with by um, other areas of the law. Uh, to the extent that it's dealing with the motives of the defendant, commercial motives, this can be dealt with by uh, considering economic harm. And if it's uh, relating to whether or not the defendant has sought permission, then that's a, a kind of circular uh, consideration to take into account. So we try and build um, uh, into fair practice, these different normative considerations and emerging from these different normative considerations are factors that can help us determine whether this is a fair quotation. And you'll see that there's some similarity with the fair use factors, but it is not, they're not exactly the same. So the nature or purpose of the quotation, the size of the quotation, its proportion to the source work, harm to the market for the source work, the impact on the integrity interests of the author, the nature of the claimant's work, and as I mentioned before, no role for good or bad faith um, and the limited role for custom. So what's the consequence? That, so that completes um, our description of, of what we consider to be global mandatory fair use. Now, what about the consequences of this? Well, one consequence is that we see that there are differences between the three-step test and Article 10.1. And in making this comparison, we do rely on the WTO panel decision and its interpretation of the three-step test. We do accept that there's been a lot of criticism of that panel decision, uh, much of which we agree with, but it is one of the um, uh, key guides to um, uh, to the three-step test in international copyright law. So we use this as a point of contrast and people will know that from this particular decision, there was a, uh, an approach by the WTO panel, which has been described by um, professors Dinwoody and uh, Dreyfus as a very formalistic approach. And as a result, what you see is um, around the acceptable scope of the exception, the three-step test is looking for uh, narrow in scope and reach, 
whereas we would say the scope of quotation can be interpreted broadly. When we think about the normative value of quotation, the three-step test um, as interpreted by the panel was very fixated on uh, rights holders' interests, whereas we think that our notion of fair practice brings into uh, play a plurality of interests. The three-step test can apply to uh, unpublished and published works, but Article 10.1 is limited to where works have already been lawfully made available to the public. The three-step test, as interpreted by the panel, ignores moral rights. The quotation exception takes them into account. Um, uh, and uh, the three-step test has been seen as cumulative in nature. We would see the elements of uh, the quotation exception as overlapping. So there are some distinct requirements, but clearly there is some percolation and overlap between, uh, say, quotation and also fair practice um, and also proportionality and fair practice. And uh, finally, that uh, the quotation exception is a royalty free exception, whereas the three step test envisages paid but permitted exceptions. So let me talk a little bit more about the three step test in view of the time I might um, skip over this because no doubt it will come up in, in questions. Um, you know, part of what we discuss in the book is how the three-step test has been seen as the only lens through which to see copyright exceptions. And we're offering Article 10.1 as not replacing this lens, but as, as certainly uh, complementing it and to be seen as a kind of powerful force alongside the three-step test, that the three-step test doesn't occupy all of the ground when it comes to exceptions. Now, um, Obviously, we're aware of what TRIPS Article 13 says, and also um, uh, the WCT, Article 10.1 and 10.2. And the argument that we raise um, is, is very similar in relation to both. So let me just deal with um, uh, the TRIPS agreement. What you see is um, in Article 2.2 um, of TRIPS that uh, a statement that nothing uh, in parts one to four of this agreement shall derogate from existing obligations that members may have to each other under the Berne Convention. And our argument is that Article 10.1 is an obligation on TRIPS members. It's an obligation and it would be odd to require compliance with an obligation as Article 2.2 does, but at the same time to constrain its compliance by displacing it with the three-step test. So our argument is that therefore Article 13 of TRIPS does not override Article 10.1 of Bern. And in terms of what the WTO panel um, said in, relationship, in relation to um, Bern and uh, TRIPS, what we'd say is that there the panel was only dealing with the minor exceptions doctrine and didn't actually uh, explicitly deal with the relationship between this mandatory exception and the three-step test. So of course that begs the question, um, what is the role for Article 13 of TRIPS? And our suggestion is that there's of course still a role and this would relate to the optional exceptions in Bern, such as in Article 10.2 and Article 10 bis, or potentially if the uh, activities do not fall within the scope of the quotation exception. So just in view of time, I will not go through exactly the same argument for the WCT. You've got the gist of it. I mean, you also have added to that the uh, agreed statement to the WCT, which we think supports our argument further. So what are some of the consequence or consequences of this particular um, uh, view. So we think, first of all, um, it's, as I said, we see it as a different lens through which to view national exceptions. And uh, one such national exception that can be viewed through this lens is the fair use exception in US law. And that actually all of the sort of um, uh, discussion and debate about whether US fair use is compliant with the three-step test uh, becomes redundant, particularly in terms of the scope of the exception. Having said that, um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't revisit US fair use. And according to our argument, uh, 
based on Article 10.1. We think that actually US fair use would need to be revisited in terms of its application to works that have not been lawfully made available to the public, that uh, better attention would have to be paid to attribution, and that there is a strong argument for not having fair use as an exception to moral rights as occurs in section 107. And perhaps there could be a different emphasis on the fairness factors. Certainly we wouldn't want, certainly our, our um, interpretation of Article 10.1 wouldn't allow certain fair, fair use factors to stampede the others. We also think that there's occasion to revisit quotation exceptions that are specific quotation exceptions within national laws. And we see, uh, we point to um, uh, a number of jurisdictions where we think that their specific quotation exceptions fall short, either because they are restricted in purpose, as we see in Portugal, or because they are limited to the types of works to which they apply, which we see in Austria and Zimbabwe, or because they're restricted to short quotations, as in France, or because they insist on incorporation into another work, as in France, or uh, a requirement of dialogue, as uh, we have seen in case law in Germany. Similarly, we would argue that um, judicial interpretation could be influenced by this view of Article 10.1. And on this basis, we do look at the Court of Justice decisions in Pelham and also Spiegel online and argue that elements of these decisions are incorrect and inconsistent with Article 10.1. Insofar as they require an element of entering into a dialogue with the work um, and also importing an identifiability or recognizability requirement of the quotation. As well, we think that parody, parody exceptions could be seen through the lens of Article 10.1 rather than through the lens of the three-step test. What advantage does that give us? Well, because quotation can be understood broadly, we don't need to worry so much about these definitional concerns between what is a parody versus satire versus pastiche, but in fact can take um, quite a relaxed view. And indeed those distinctions might be more relevant to fair practice and the expressive value of that speech than to whether um, the exception kicks in at all. And finally, we are interested, we're very much interested in the way in which guidelines and, and in the book we note publishers guidelines could be revisited in light of this interpretation. In our research, we noticed that large swathes of publisher guidelines take an incredibly narrow and risk averse view of what is acceptable quotation. And our hope is that possibly um, publishers guidelines could take a much more flexible or at least realistic view of quotations that are permissible without having to insist that authors are getting paid permission um, from copyright owners. And indeed, in my colleague's um, uh, wonderful book, Drafting Copyright Exceptions, um, Emily Hudson talks about the way in which cult cultural institutions may be receptive to actually uh, thinking about quotation as uh, a mechanism for using works uh, and that um, they are seeing the potential for relying on this exception. Uh, and so there may well be uh, the potential to, to kind of develop guidelines amongst certain user communities um, when it comes to quotation. So thank you, Sean. I know that was a bit longer than we discussed, um, but we got there in the end. And I'll stop sharing my screen. It was, it was quite fantastic to both of you and I'm, and I'm glad we took the time. There was, it, was, uh, it was due, it was due. Um, Peter, so we have, as I mentioned, uh, we have Peter Yazi and Bert Hugenholtz kind of prepared to give a few, a few remarks. And uh, they're both uh, the original chairs of this user rights network as we formed it in, in 2011. And uh, Peter, over to you. Thank you, Sean. And, and, and thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Lionel. I, 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 this, is, this is an extraordinarily important book and the the only the only criticism that i can offer on it, of it is that 
um, for some of us, it comes far too late. Um, you know, we have we 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 have spent as as scholar advocates in this area, we have spent fifty years uh, contesting the notion that open, flexible, culturally based copyright exceptions are given to us as matters of grace with no particular contours or, or, or mandates behind them. It has been very difficult, both in the United States, about which I obviously know most, and I think also elsewhere in the world, to, to argue for the, the, the importance, the, 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 con the constitutive importance of such exceptions without having an argument uh, based in legal authority of the kind that that you have now now provided so uh, it's a it's an ex it, it really this this is a, a piece of work that should make an extraordinary difference on the ground as it's as it's um, as its insights and its implications are are fully understood so that's that's my criticism. What took you so long? Um, and my my compliment is is by way of analogy, and that is that as I thought about what you've done here, the the literary analogy that occurred to me was the 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 eighteen fifty three story by Edgar Allan Poe, the the purloined letter, uh, in which. Um, Thanks to the the kind of the the, the insight the, the the insights of genius that that the Poe's proto detective C. Auguste Dupin brings to the situation the the blackmail letter which has been has been sought everywhere in every possible hiding place in every possible. Um, uh, disguise is found where it has been left in plain sight, um, where, where, where the, the blackmailer cleverly placed it all along. So in a sense, this is a, this is a, a proposition, what you have revealed is a proposition that, that, that has been hiding in plain sight, but just as it took the genius of Dupin to discover the, the purloined letter, so I think it has taken both extraordinary effort and extraordinary insight on, on, on your parts to restore to us uh, or to give to us for the first time Article 10.1. And I have questions um, and I will, I will ask one, not because I expect necessarily an immediate response or even a, a response in the course of the the, the hour, but because I, I want to unburden myself of it, and then it can become part of whatever discourse follows uh, Barron's intervention. And it is this, and it, it goes to the, the lawfully made available condition. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the cruxes that, that, that we argued about in the United States back in the, in the, in the, in the 80s, when we were working our way through a series of cases of which the most prominent or notorious was probably the Salinger case about quotation in the context of biography and criticism was the question of to what extent technically unpublished material that was nevertheless lawfully available in, in, in archives was fair game for fair use. And of course, we, we solved that by amending section 107 in a, in a kind of you know, crude but ultimately serviceable way. But I would be very interested, if time permits, to hear your views about the extent to which the lawfully made available condition on Article 10.1 as you interpret it will or will not apply to unpublished archival holdings. With which, it's yours, Baird. 
Yeah, let's have let's have Bernd go next, and then we can we can take those questions if you guys like. Uh, Professor Hugenholz. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, hi, Lionel and Tanya. It was uh, a wonderful presentation, and so were the papers. But I must admit, I haven't read the book yet. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> being an academic, that should not impede me from saying a few things. Um, one thing, of course, is that we all learn from your presentation and your papers and our, I assume also your book is that it's always a good thing to actually read what's in a treaty or in, a, in an act. I, I always tell my students this, but they and we often overlook this, shall is not the same as may. And I uh, agree with you that that should have normative consequences. I agree with a lot of what you've been saying, by the way. Um, I do have uh, a question, a question that was also already raised in the, the very uh, fertile chat uh, that's been going on along while you were speaking, um, which is uh, about opera opera uh, operationalizing this concept of global mandatory fair use. How can we do that? Uh, certainly something that Sean would be thinking about, uh, this whole project would be thinking about, how can we give it teeth in international relations or at the national level? Um, there are a number of impediments, obviously, to doing so. And you mentioned a couple in your paper. What, uh, but the, the first one I want to point out, and I don't think it's mentioned in, any, in the paper, but perhaps it is in the book, um, the Berne Convention is only self-executing, has only direct effect as a, as a hardcore set of norms in uh, some countries. Uh, mostly those countries are civil law countries rather than common law countries. That's one uh, impediment. And another one, a typically European one, is the uh, holding of the uh, European Court of Justice, the CJEU, in Funke Median and Spiegel online that uh, there is no space for uh, limitations and exceptions beyond the uh, acquis. You're obviously familiar with that case law. This applied only within the EU, not to you anymore. So it's only our problem, but it is a problem for Europe. For Slovenia, I would say particularly, I understand that they don't have quotation at all in their national law. Um, and then there's the logic of burn that you also discuss in your paper, which in a, does not really sit well with a mandatory user right. Uh, in your paper, you argue that, well, that's a technicality in a sense, and we shouldn't uh, make that into too much of, a, of an obstacle. Uh, what you point out, and I think rightly point out, is that the Berne Convention, um, since uh, mid last century, has gradually developed from a purely uh, coordinating function into an international substantive code offering substantive norms with arguably universal application. And that would therefore imply that this mandatory fair use would apply regardless of uh, whether or not it, it, it is invoked in respect of a burn union work or not. Um, I must warn you, however, that there is a, 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 a dangerous downside to that argument, the universalist argument that uh, namely that if you apply that to the minimum rights of the burn convention, you uh, lose flexibility for national deviation. Uh, there are still uh, national legislators who prefer to offer lower levels of protection uh, to their national, uh, to their purely domestic uh, uh, authors and situations. I always tell, I always tell my students that technically speaking, the Berne Convention allows national legislation to, act, to abolish copyright. Um, 
uh, and remain a, a happy member of the Bern Union at the same time. So there, there's a loss of flexibility that uh, uh, is implied in that universalist argument. I'm not saying it's a bad argument, but this is something to reckon with. Now my question, my question to Lionel and Tanya, how to give teeth to this global mandatory fair use? Um, I have a suggested answer. Uh, thinking about this uh, Article 10.1 as a mandatory user right uh, um, it makes me at least uh, believe that it, what we're really looking at here is a fundamental freedom, a species of free speech that perhaps is better interpreted, implied and given teeth in the way we already do that with fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, note that in the 1960s, when the Stockholm revision took place, the notion of human rights and freedoms was very much on the rise. And looking at Article 10, one burn uh, as a, a species of a, a, a free, as a free speech norm in, in effect, uh, I think also would solve the problem of competing neighboring rights, such as the uh, EU snippet right, which is already being discussed in the chat um, uh, uh, by several uh, uh, participants to this discussion. So again, my question is, uh, how, to, how do we give teeth to this norm? Would the best approach be to see it as a, as a species of a, a human rights norm, uh, which we can then give teeth by way of national court's interpretation of copyright in the light of fundamental freedoms. Uh, similar to the way courts uh, all over the world already do that uh, in the light of uh, existing international uh, free speech norms or in Europe, uh, the, EU, the freedoms of the EU Charter and the European Convention on Human Rights. Note that the Court of Justice encourages national courts to actually do that. Okay, this is a very long question that I've already partly answered. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'll stop right here. You're welcome to fully answer it, Bernd, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, can, can I, Lionel, do you mind, can I just butt in and, and I want to just address a, a couple of things. So, so Pisa, the question you raise about unpublished archival works is a very important one. And I was reminded of um, how in, in Emily Hudson's empirical work, when she was interviewing uh, a number of users, they said, you know, we like the look of this quotation exception. We think it has real potential, but um, they were a bit hesitant or a bit concerned by the fact that it has the requirement of lawfully made available to the public. And the risk was that they saw it as being inapplicable to unpublished collections. So exactly the question that, that you're asking. Now, I think it's important to remember that we're talking, we're not talking about unpublished versus published, that the concept within Article 10.1 is lawfully made available to the public. So we can think about made available as including, I think, where it's within an archive if it has been lawfully placed there. I think that is a possible interpretation that can be taken. Um, uh, so that's, that's one way of, of dealing with that particular argument. Um, but also to say, and this really goes to the relationship of 10.1 to the other exceptions, you know, it may well be that in some instances um, where it's not possible to show that lawfully made available to the public is, is, is satisfied, that actually this is where um, Article 9.2 or Article 10 bis 2 um, uh, is appropriately invoked. Um, on, um, and, and, and Lionel may want to say something about this um, as, as well. On um, Bernd's points about flexibility, so, so you're right. I mean, in arguing for a particular um, uh, meaning of Article 10.1, this does constrain um, the flexibility of Bern Union members, but I don't think we're being um, 
incredibly prescriptive. I think we, you know, a lot of our argument is based on the language of the provision. And in terms of the, the fair practice element and what can inform fair practice, actually there, there are these plurality of considerations. And we're not saying that, in fact, the factors that we set out have to be featured in national legislation, but that these uh, this, this could be one way of doing it, but it's important that um, the full kind of range of fair practice is given effect to by national legislation. Now, some legislations do that, I think, simply by having fair practice in their quotation exception. That's fine, as long as the courts are, um, are taking into account um, uh, these wider considerations of fair practice as we argue for. But again, there's still scope within that in saying that, that you know, courts have to take account of um, economic harm and moral harm, there can be different weightings depending on the jurisdiction. If we're thinking about expressive purposes, that is going to be within the realm of domestic law as to how expressive purposes are prioritized. The US does it differently to the EU, for example, or to um, uh, the way Strasbourg does it, I should say. Um, so so there, is, there is that. Um, I, think, I think there's still quite a lot of scope uh, for flexibility, but you're right, it, it, it does mean that it is constrained to some extent. And so we think that, you know, short quotations should be removed from national legislation. We think that um, various exceptions do need to be revisited and, and thought of in light of this. Uh, but we don't see this as incredibly kind of um, or entirely prescriptive as to what um, domestic uh, laws uh, or countries are doing. The question of how to give it teeth, that's a, that's a good question. And in fact, um, Henning Grosser Khan asked us in a previous talk, you know, what, how realistic is it that there'd be a WTO panel um, uh, procedure about this? You know, well, aside from the fact that, you know, the appellate body is, is I think only just sort of getting back into um, uh, functioning again, you know the difficulty here, and we and we do mention this in the book, is that it, it requires a state to be sufficiently concerned about the, I think, the commercial interests that are impacted by failing to uh, properly implement the quotation right. And so, in this context, really, um, perhaps it's intermediaries that are going to be sort of pushing the most. And you know, would would we see the U.S. Uh, bringing uh, an action against the EU, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think it's it's. Um, I'm not sure how likely that is. Uh, so I, I am a bit doubtful about the way in which the WTO can be giving this teeth, and I wonder if, in fact, the way to give it teeth is in these sort of more localized fashions of 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 trying to interact with different user communities. Uh, about the, the flexibilities that are within the quotation exception if it is already in national laws. Obviously, if it's not, then, then you're talking about trying to intervene at a political level um, to, to influence change. Uh, Lionel. Yeah, I mean, there's been so many, apart from Peter and Bernd's uh, questions, there have been so many good questions online as, as well. Um, so firstly, very quickly on Peter, I agree really with uh, what Tanya said and what Emily has said. There's a big distinction between publication and making available and making available to my mind includes making available in a library. But I've seen your follow up. Uh, what about if it's made available in a library subject to conditions? I, I don't think we've got, we've not gone as far as to be able to give you a, 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 an answer. I don't think there's any material on which to forge an answer for that, but I'll go back to the material with that question in mind. Um, and if I if I find any way to give us an answer, I will. Um, with regard to Burnt, uh, in the uh, in the, the position in the EU with the uh, newfound inflexibility that the Court of Justice has imposed to, through its interpretation of Article 5 of the Information Society Directive. I think the answer probably has to be that the, the Court of Justice has to revisit uh, the interpretation of the individual exceptions within Article 8.5. If, if it says you can't go beyond those exceptions, 
and it recognizes the force of our argument about what the obligations of the member states are under the Berne Convention, then it has to revisit its understanding of, for example, quotation uh, in, in Article 5 and use that as the way in to reintroduce uh, flexibility into the EU. With respect to um, your, your broader answer about uh, whether we should conceptualize the quotation right as a, a human right, I think there's, as you say, there's material that can help you do that. The timing is particularly helpful because uh, the mid 60s, you have uh, other covenants, uh, including the <coughs> covenant on civil and political rights, which recognizes freedom of expression just shortly before uh, the Stockholm revision. So there is that kind of coincidence. You already have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in place. <coughs> I don't know, I'm slightly, I, I, I guess I just was brought up for too long in the common law system without, uh, well, at a time when we didn't think we had common law human rights. And so um, I, I didn't, I haven't really uh, been all that attracted to uh, um, creating flexibilities through invoking um, the charter within the EU. I, I, I've never really um, strongly supported that, Be partly because I think it introduces really um, difficult for which I might say meaningless balancing exercises, certainly balancing exercises that I found it very, very difficult uh, to get to grips with. <clears throat> but I think you're, you're absolutely right. It might be one way to uh, convince uh, the court of justice within the EU setting that the quotation exception in article five is much more important and therefore needs to be interpreted uh, with the kind of breadth that we're suggesting than the other exceptions. Um, so I'm happy to consider it, but it's it wouldn't be the natural place where I'd go to. I'd, I'd also add that there are certain, um, there is a school of thought uh, represented by people like uh, Abraham Drazenauer, who I'm friends with and I, whose work I really love, but who wants to um, see copyright through this dialogic lens, which is underpinned by Kantian human rights, the human rights of the later author. And I think that there's something worrying about requiring a later author before you create a permission to quote. Permission to quote, for example, on those inscriptions or in dictionaries of quotations, to my mind, shouldn't be dependent upon the user having this special status of being an author themselves. So I'm slightly worried about invoking rights insofar as it introduces those kind of conditions which aren't there in Article 10.1. So I see maybe a rights conception of Article 10.1 as slightly limiting its explicit terms. Thank you, uh, Lionel and, and Tanya for Incredibly rich discussion. I, I think that uh, you know Bernd's description of the of the of the text uh, as being you know very rich and and containing a huge number of comments and discussion is just a reflection of how provoking your work really has been. I want to keep to my promise and and end us on time, but also with the promise that we're going to keep this room open and and continue. Um, a bit of discussion under, under Chatham House rules for as long as both our speakers and our audience are, are willing to hang out. There probably will be a hard line on that at some point, but we can certainly continue for another half an hour or so. So thank you um, everyone for attending this uh, launch of this year's series. And um, we hope to see you at future events, which we will be contacting you shortly about. And